Good morning, everybody. We are sorry for the delay. We had a few technical difficulties. Thank you for joining us today on Zoo School Live. My name is Laura, and I'm one of our educators here. As with every Zoo School episode, if you guys have questions, make sure you drop them down in the comments, and we will go through towards the end to try to answer some of those for you. So today we're going to have some playtime with one of our uh, very exciting species we have here. Some of you guys are probably familiar with the domestic ferret. You've probably seen them around. Maybe some of you guys have them as pets yourself. But did you know that they were actually domesticated over 2,500 years ago? They've been around for a long, long time. We're gonna talk about why humans decided to kind of bring them into our homes and under our care and look at the adaptations that they have that help them uh, along that journey as well as with their wild counterparts, how to be successful hunters and survive. So as we get started here, I'm going to introduce you to our two domesticated ferrets. Uh, their names are Robin Hood and Little John, and we'll meet them real quickly before we let them explore this fun play zone, okay? So let's see who wants to be the first one out. It looks like that's gonna be Mr. Robin Hood. So Robin Hood is kind of your typical ferret color. He's got this nice gray, brown, tan coat, and he has a little mask on his face, which is where we got the name Robin Hood, like the bandit. And he's our smaller of the two, so we're gonna let him start his little exploration. And then we're gonna bring out his little friend, Little John, who is not so little after all. He's actually our larger of the two ferrets. And uh, like the Robin Hood story, he's a pretty big guy. So Little John has this kind of tan and blonde coloration with a little tiny mask, it's just not as apparent. So we're gonna let them get started exploring as we talk a little bit about their history. So the domesticated ferret is actually thought to have originated uh, from the European polecat, which is a wild species that would look very similar to what Robin Hood looks like. And they're not 100% sure where the first domesticated ferret came from, but it is expected that it was potentially an animal that's found in Northern Africa and was eventually introduced into Europe. Now, if we look at the Latin name of our ferrets, they are domesticate and they are called Mustela putorius furo. If we actually break that name down, it means stinky mouse thief, which is probably one of the best names I think I've ever heard for an animal, stinky mouse thief. Now, why are they called stinky mice thieves? because they do have a little bit of a scent. They belong to the Mustela family and that has uh, animals like weasels and minks and they do have kind of a pretty strong smell, especially in the wild. So they have a, a, some scent glands that make that smell and that's something they can use to communicate with each other and other animals. Now the uh, mouse part is actually from the Mustela name and part of the reason why they get that part, that that uh, term in their name is because they do hunt small animals in the wild like mice. So stinky, mouse, and then the thief part is probably because ferrets and similar animals are very, very good at sneaking around and they're very curious. So our ferrets really enjoy um, taking toys and especially Robin Hood, he really likes to carry little, um, stuffed animals around and hide them. So that thief part, they are very, very good at getting into things and very, very good at sneaking around and stealing things. So stinky mouse thief. Now, when we say that they're a domestic species, what we mean is that you won't exactly find this ferret in the wild. The way we kind of identify an animal as being domesticated is the fact that they actually keep a few of their juvenile or young animal traits. And a lot of times we characterize this as them being cuter or more friendly, more docile, easier to get around with. Um, they're less fearful of humans and new things. And we see that with lots of domestic species like our dogs and cats at home, as well as things like goats and sheep and cows and horses. So domestication means that they are more likely to get along with humans because they do kind of adapt to being less fearful and less aggressive. Now, they were first mentioned in history by the Greeks way back in 450 BC. That's a long, long time ago. 
And they were mentioned in um, association with rabbits. So it's believed that the Greeks and other ancient civilizations used ferrets to help them hunt rabbits. So if we take a look at our friend Little John right there who's clumsily crawling around, they have this really long skinny body and they're able to squeeze into really tiny spaces with that body. And they're super, super flexible. They can kind of bend in all different directions and they can actually turn their whole body around when they're in a tube that's not any bigger than themselves. And so this makes them really great at going through tunnels underground. So it's believed that the Greeks and other ancient civilizations in Mesopotamia and the Middle East actually would send a ferret or a similar animal into a rabbit hole and that ferret would chase the rabbit out and then the hunters and the dogs and anything else would be waiting on the other side. And a lot of times ferrets were introduced pretty much anywhere rabbits were introduced because while rabbits became a pretty good food source for people and fur source and things like that, in a lot of the areas that they were brought, there weren't any natural predators that were controlling those populations. So the rabbits started to become a problem. They would eat crops and um, destroy food sources for humans. So ferrets were often used to seek them out. Now they were domesticated, like I said, they were, they were really kind of bred and um, kept under constant human care around 2,500 years ago. They were first brought to Europe in um, probably the early BC years, but their first mention is actually in the 1200s. People that were royalty that had um, you know, hunting parties and dogs and horses and stuff, they actually would, would take on people called royal ferreters. So someone would be in charge of caring for and training and hunting with these ferrets. So if you had status and money in the early 1200s in Europe, you probably had a royal ferreter on your payroll and they would go out and hunt with your hunting parties with their ferrets. Now that became kind of a thing of the past more recently. It's actually illegal to hunt with ferrets in a lot of areas, but the mongoose, which is a similar animal, is used in some countries to continue this tradition. Now, we think that they first came to the United States on ships. So um, many different animals have made that journey and it makes sense that ferrets would as well because they are good at hunting. Remember, their name means stinky mouse thief. So not only were they good at hunting rabbits, but they were great at hunting mice and rats. So sailors would actually bring them on board on purpose to help cut down the, the population of those rodents that could spread disease and eat their food supplies and things like that. So inevitably they made the journey over on ships to the United States. And once they were here, they actually took on a couple different roles. So of course they did help with rabbit control and rodent control. In fact, the US Department of Agriculture, which kind of monitors farming and different practices, they encouraged people to bring ferrets onto their land and into their homes um, in the early 18th century and 19th century so that they could reduce the population of mice and rats. But another really cool thing that ferrets were especially good at was actually going through really small spaces and helping to carry items. So let's say you're building a home or a large barn or something and you needed to run some pipes or wires or things like that. You could attach one end of that to the ferret and then release it through the wall or that small space and they would carry it around for you. So not only did they help with pest control of all different kinds, they actually helped with construction and development and the industrialization of our country, which is pretty special. Now, once rodenticides or different pest control options became uh, available, again, they were kind of transitioned out of being rodent control. We don't really use them for that anymore, but they were still around. People had them living in their homes and their farms and, and everything. So they sort of became more of that companion animal. So ferrets in the 20th century started to stay in people's homes as more of a pet versus an actual um, pest control or, or hunting tool. And they've been in our homes and in our hearts ever since. So our friend Robin Hood and Little John actually came to the zoo in 2019 from the Weasel Warrior Ferret Sanctuary. And um, there are tons and tons of reasons why they can make exciting little animals to have in your homes, but there are also a lot of reasons why they can be a challenge. So here at the zoo, whenever we bring in new animals, we try to make sure we're either helping out a sanctuary or we're following very strict um, species protocols within other zoos. In, ferret, in our uh, ferret's case, they were unfortunately um, without a home, so they were a rescue animal. 
and we were able to provide them a forever home here. As their natural history suggests, they are very good at sneaking around and getting in and out of spaces. We had to create kind of a uh, ferret-proof playground today so that we weren't chasing them all around the classroom. And that's one of the things that can make them a challenge in your home if you do think that a ferret might be a fun pet to have. They are excellent escape artists and will get into all of the little spaces that you do not want them to get into. They also can be um, a little bit destructive. They do like to explore and they do like to dig around and, and kind of chew on things. You can see they're exploring different bags, different tubes. They have boxes and shredded paper. They really like to get into pretty much everywhere. Now in the wild here in the United States, we actually have a wild species of ferret. It's known as the black footed ferret. However, Robin Hood and Little John are not directly related. They are different from the European polecat that this species would have originated from. But they do look a little bit similar. So black-footed ferrets would be uh, kind of in the same color as our friend Robin Hood on the left there with more of a, a brown and tan coat um, and a little black mask. However, they're a little bit bigger and their natural habitat is going to be the Midwestern prairies. And this species, the, the black-footed ferret, was unfortunately almost extinct due to um, human interference. So one of the things, remember they are hunters, they're very good at digging in tunnels, and one of the favorite food sources of the black-footed ferret are prairie dogs. Now prairie dogs have had a pretty bad relationship with farmers in the past because prairie dogs do burrow, they create little tunnels, and um, they unfortunately can pose a risk to livestock. So um, in, in the prairie, if you have horses or cattle walking around and they step into a prairie dog hole, they could break a leg, they could get really hurt. And for farmers, that's their livelihood. So unfortunately, um, years ago, farmers were really trying to kind of get rid of prairie dogs in their natural habitat. And when an animal loses its food source, it starts to suffer as well. So unfortunately, black-footed ferrets were thought to be extinct for a long time uh, until um, one was accidentally discovered by a uh, farmer's dog and thankfully reintroduction programs were established at zoos breeding programs across the country and now they've been returned to the wild um, now we actually do have black-footed ferrets here at elmwood park zoo they live down in our prairie exhibit near the prairie dogs and the gila monsters and those animals are actually retired from those breeding facilities so they come here to elmwood to have a nice relaxing uh, retirement in their last few years after they have done a whole lot to help protect their wild counterparts. But again, Robin Hood and Little John are not directly related to the Blackfoot ferret. They just share some adaptations. So they have that same long body. You can see very good at wiggling in and out of places. And they have um, a great sense of smell. Now what Robin Hood is demonstrating here is, uh, is how he might cache some food. So in the wild, if they hunt something like a mouse or a shrew, um, or even a rabbit and they aren't going to eat the whole thing what they can actually do is they can take it back into their den and hide it and eat it later so sometimes we see him picking up little stuffed animals and carrying them into little safe places and it's pretty adorable for us but it's actually a natural behavior for them they also have um very good hearing so you can see their ears kind of stick up a little bit from their face this allows them to listen for animals that might be digging around or crawling around near them and it helps them to watch out for predators so in the wild there are tons of things that would go after a ferret or a weasel like animal large birds of prey coyotes foxes things like that so they do have to watch out even though they are hunters themselves they do have to watch out for predators of their own so i want to make sure if we have any questions today that we save a little bit of time. We'll just enjoy watching them run around a moment and we'll check to see if we have any questions. Remember, if you do have something you'd like to ask about Robin Hood and Little John, you can pop it in the comment section right now and we will do our best to answer that. So in the meantime, we'll just enjoy watching them do what they do best. All right, so Ryan would like to know how soft they are. That's a great question, Ryan. Let me see if I can get one of our friends to come over and say hi. Hi. We'll get Mr. <laughs> we'll get little little John here. Whoop. And we can take a nice close look at his fur and his little face. 
if he wants to sit still. They're very good at wiggling around, but you can kind of see he's got some different types of hair. So he has this very soft under hair, and then on the outside, the darker color is more like a guard hair, which is a, <laughs> a little bit um, rougher. So they're, they're kind of soft, but definitely not as soft as, say, like a rabbit or um, a chinchilla. They have a little bit more coarse hair. And that's probably very helpful in the wild. It would help them to protect themselves as they crawl around in holes and, and crevices and things like that. Great question, Ryan. All right, Peyton, age four, wants to know if they can jump high. Thankfully for us, they are not super great at jumping, um, but they can jump a little bit. They're actually the best at crawling and uh, digging and tunneling. So they can jump a little bit, but not really very far. Their long body doesn't make it very easy for them to jump far distances. Um, but again, very, very, very good at squeezing and crawling into things, which is why we kind of had to create a very um, tight space today to make sure they didn't go on an adventure where uh, we didn't want them to. All right, so Kimberly would like to know how big can they get? So Robin Hood and Little John are full size. They are about three years old right now and ferrets on, in general can uh, grow into the six to 10 years depending on you know their health, but they're full size. Um, they each weigh around two pounds, which is not a whole lot. Now, obviously there is some variation. There's some difference because you can see that Little John is significantly bigger than his friend Robin Hood. Um, but otherwise, this is pretty average size for them. All right, so Lincoln, age nine, would like to know what colors their fur can be. So that's a great question. A lot of times the domesticated ferrets you'll see are like Robin Hood, that kind of dark brown, tan, um, a little bit of gray in there with the mask on their face. Um, <laughs> Um, but they do come in a variety of colors. So you have kind of that blonde color that we have with Little John. They can actually be albino, which is pretty cool. So that means that they would lack a lot of pigment or color and they could be almost all white, kind of like a cream color. So we typically see the browns, um, the, the tans and creams, and sometimes all white, which is pretty cool. All right, guys. We'll enjoy watching these guys play for just a few more minutes just in case anyone has any last questions. So they are gonna explore, like I said, using some different senses, using their eyesight, their sense of smell, their hearing. Now they also sleep a whole lot. So what we're seeing right now is not what they do all day long. They sleep most of the day, similar to a cat. So they're gonna take naps all day and, and have brief periods of running around and playing. All right, Kimberly would like to know, are they allergic to anything? Um, that's a good question. To be honest, I don't believe that ours are allergic to anything necessarily. Now, anytime we give any of our animals here at the zoo new foods or new things to play with um, or new treats and stuff, we have to be very careful and we observe them. So the reason that little John is in that bag right now is that there are some very fun treats inside there um, that he is probably nomming on. <laughs> and uh, that Robin Hood's gonna get a little jealous about. But we can't just give them anything whenever we want. We do have to make sure that it's safe for them, so we usually have a period where we watch them with a new toy or watch them with a new food and um, make sure it's safe. And as far as their general diet goes, they don't get a whole lot of different things. In the wild, ferrets are carnivores. They're going to hunt all kinds of small animals. But here at the zoo and any domesticated ferret, we don't feed them meats or animal products. They actually get a very specific ferret diet. So very similar to what we would give our cats and our dogs. Um, because over the thousands of years that they've been under human care, their dietary needs have changed. They don't necessarily need to eat a raw mouse anymore. They're, um, they're going to need some different types of things instead. So um, that's, uh, that makes it a little easier to make sure they're not allergic to anything. All right, guys, that looks like it is probably the last of our questions for the day. I hope you guys have enjoyed hanging out with our friends Robin Hood and Little John the Ferret and learning a little bit about how they came into human lives and for thousands of years have been a very helpful species to have around. Please make sure if you have any other questions that you drop them in the comments, we can come back and answer them later. And be sure to tune in on Thursday for our next episode of Zoo School Live. And as always, have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody.